Well, good afternoon. These uh, hours have gone by uh, quickly for me. Uh, I don't know what your perception is. There was a preacher who tended to be rather long, and he was also a very forceful personality. He wanted to manage the congregation, where they sat and all that, and right in the middle of the peroration, a rhetorical masterpiece of his sermon, a man got up and walked out, and his church where that pastor said, where are you going? And he said, to shave. And the preacher said, we generally do that before we come. And he said, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it hasn't been too long. It's been good to be with you. I want to thank Dr. Didway again. You're very fortunate to have him as dean. Uh, no one in American preaching culture over the last three decades and more uh, knows more, has more context, insight into the preaching culture of this nation than Dr. Michael Didway has presented a great gift to thousands and thousands of preachers through the magazine and now his ministry. It's good to be here. Michael, and, uh, and uh, just appreciate his friendship. And thanks to Anderson, all the folks here, and you staff faculty member, Dr. Dante Wright, who's a good friend of mine, just down the road from uh, Waco, Texas, where I'm returning uh, this afternoon. Uh, Baylor University has a funny policy. If they give you a check, they like you to show up now and then, and I've been trying to... <laughs> I just, you know, I've been trying to get around that, but they just keep on saying you must put in an appearance now and then. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, kid me a little. They said there was a Gregory sighting the other day, so I, but uh, I've got to get back there. Thank you so much. Now, this is coming in midstream if you just come in. We're talking about the use of lived experiences in sermons, formerly known as illustrations. If you missed what I said the other day, I prefer to speak of lived experiences so we can, in a sense, talk about it in a new way. A lived experience, in my definition, is anything outside the text of Scripture from nature or human experience, which covers just about anything that could shed light on the exposition of the Word of God. Now, not to be tedious, but just to review something that I said the other day. And that is all illustrations work LLL -L -L to HHH. -H -H. <laughs> Something in the world of lower, lesser, lighter, nature or human experience has a point of contact with something in the text, the higher, the holier, the heavier. So when you're thinking about lived experience, Typically, it works this way. You have a text, and you want to match that with something lower, lesser, lighter that is in the world of human experience or the natural world. Now, as I said, sometimes you can begin here and go to here. I mentioned the other day F.W. Borum, likely the greatest illustrator in the last 200 years, started here. He would stick over something in a life or nature and would append it to a text. Now, he was a balanced observer, so that did not become parochial or insular or tendacious. He wasn't just chasing hobby horses. But I can't give you any more basic diagram than this simple diagram about how to think about the use of lived experiences. Here's the text. Here's human life and nature. Now, just to recap, just a moment, we started out talking about the theology behind illustrating our lived experience. We discussed other reasons for. We discussed the qualities of. Now, if I could start this afternoon with a bit about, for want of a better word, perils or pitfalls in illustrating, some things to watch out for. First one is, never use two when one will do. There are a lot of Sundays out there. And you will find that there are about a dozen domains that is kinds of stories 
that you're going to use in sermons. So many of them fit into about a dozen categories. We're going to talk about some of those in a minute. Don't use them up. Tom Long says a preacher looking at the Sundays ahead is like someone driving down one of the long, gun barrel, straight, flat roads that we have out in West Texas. There are not any beautiful hills and tall trees in West Texas. There's flat land and no trees. So when you're driving down a gun barrel road, you can see all the way to the horizon. And along that, on the side of it, are telephone poles, old creosote poles linked to one another by telephone wires. And you can see them all the way to the horizon. Well, the faster you go, the faster they go by you. That's the way Sundays are for the preacher. You see them out there all the way to the horizon, and the faster you go, <laughs> the faster they come at you. You're going to need a lot of stories. Never use two when one will do, and if it's the right one, <laughs> that will do. Now, a second pitfall is failing to vary the type of stories within sermons and from sermon to sermons. Now, there, there are a number of coefficients with that. In most churches, you'll have at least three generations out there, and in an age church, you'll have five generations listening to the sermon. Now, if you tell a World War II story, D-Day, Pearl Harbor, Preachers resort to that a lot. Who did you appeal to? Now you appeal to the octogenarians, old, old people for whom that's an embedded memory. Interesting thing, four years ago they told us at Baylor that the incoming freshman class had no living memory of 9-11. If you have someone sitting there that had no living memory of 9-11, it flattens history. So that Alexander the Great D-Day and 9-11 all belong <laughs> to the remote past. On the other hand, if you quote contemporary recording artists, pop singers, in your sermon exclusively, that's your genre, that's your go-to, who did you leave out? <laughs> you left out that great-grandparent. Now, one clue to reaching everybody is that the stories that have the widest reach are nature stories. Now, I've just discovered this. Didn't read that anywhere. I've just discovered it. Stories out of nature. Dog, cat, animal, earth sciences. That has the widest reach. It has a broad appeal. You're generally safe age-wise and going there. Otherwise, you need to think of a stew, a potpourri, a montage. What do you want to say it of stories? So that in your sermon, there's at least a story that captures generations sitting in front of you. That's a challenge. It's really more of an art uh, and a craft than it is a science. Fred Craddock suggests that when you're writing your sermons, put, imagine a circle of chairs in front of you. Not just with typical stereotyped people. Well, here's a preschool. Here's, you know, he says actual members of your congregation. Put them in the chair and think about stories that would appeal to a representative group of your congregation. That will help you vary stories within the sermon and from sermon to sermon. Now, I grew up uh, listening to a beloved pastor, 29 years. Uh, uh, he was uh, a graduate of Baylor Southwestern Seminary, wonderful pastor, mentor. But in World War II, he was on his way to England as a chaplain and a U-boat shot the ship out from under him and he floated in the Atlantic for three days. The difficulty with illustrating in that church was that the whole congregation floated for nearly 30 years. It didn't make any difference what the occasion was. This was the go-to story and it lost all potency. It lost all value. The kids in the back of the church on Sunday night would say, we're going to float again now because it was a go-to story. And I say this because many of us get balkanized, we get, in a, we get in, a, in a cul-de-sac on the kind of stories we tell, depending on our interests. One too many golfing stories. 
one too many TV show stories. In my own instance, the thing I have to watch out of a love of history is always one too many history stories. I've had to come to grips that the majority of people are not nearly as excited about history as I am. In fact, quite the opposite. They're unexcited about history. So what appeals to me doesn't have an appeal to the majority of people. Watch yourself and put yourself in the opposite direction. Now, another thing that I would want to say about that is uh, don't introduce illustrations. That, that, I mean, that's like saying, now, let me illustrate. That's like saying, I'm about to walk. Watch me put one foot in front of the other. That never, that belongs to this thought. Never stand outside the sermon and narrate what you're about to do in the sermon. That's just a principle. That is, you stop and say, now, I didn't have much time to study this week. That's standing outside the sermon and narrating what you're about to do. They're going to find that out. <laughs> Don't draw a bullseye around you. Or you're going to say, I know this is a corny joke. You've probably heard it. Well, don't warn them. Just go ahead and tell it. You'll find that in any profession. A concert pianist doesn't sit down at a Steinway and say, oh, now let me tell you what I'm about to do. It's Nike. They just do it. Same thing with illustrating. Don't, don't tag it by saying, now, I've been explaining this text. Let me tell you a story. No, no, no. They're wired. They understand. Don't announce what you're going to do before you do it. And I think yesterday, just to understand another pitfall, I won't repeat it. Don't tell other people's stories as if they happen to you. I won't go over that again, but it has happened. Preachers do get caught. Sometimes there's a big price for it. Another thing about stories, if you tell one from your pastoral experience, let me suggest that you not do it from the counseling room of the pastor you're in. I followed a man who was dismissed in my second pastorate because Sunday by Sunday he would take incidences from the counseling room, drag them into the pulpit in a church with a hundred people there in a little village. You ever live in a little village? Everybody knows everybody's business. And it literally resulted in congregants looking at the people he was talking about because of taking it. When I, I literally do this when I tell a story from a pastor. You can ask people that have heard me preach in a pastoral situation. I say in a church, long ago and far away. It's like the beginning of Star Wars. I do. I say in a church, and I mean that, so that they understand if they come talk to me, they're not going to wind up in the pulpit as an example. So I say in a church, I do it every time, long ago and far away, so that they understand I am not washing their clothes in front of that congregation. It, uh, it's a good way to kill your counseling ministry and possibly be shown the door if you drag people's problems into contemporary sermons that you've just heard. Just a word of, suffi word of sufficient for the wise or something. Now, let me go to a whole other species of illustrating, and that is object lessons. And speak to that, but that is using a physical object. This is not showing a clip. It's taking a physical object to the pulpit. Upside and downside. Let me give you a downside story. One of the downside stories is when they don't work, the sermon is over. If an object lesson doesn't work, you just as well give the benediction. People are washed over with it. I remember I had a stewardship speaker one time. I won't name names to protect the guilty, but he, uh, he got up in front of a given church and he held up a dollar. And he said, if you will tithe, God will stretch your money. And it turned out it was a rubber dollar. And he did like this. It was over. I knew that congregation. I knew how they thought. I said, this just ended at the very beginning of the sermon when he stretched a rubber dollar. <laughs> Another one, this was an aspiring student preacher preaching from Isaiah 40. 
end of it. If you wait on the Lord, you'll well, mount up with wings as eagles. He had taken one of those balsa wood planes, one of those light toy planes that has a propeller on a rubber band. Anybody remember those? You wind it up and let it go. He hid it in the pulpit. And in a great moment of inspiration, he said, if you wait on the Lord, you'll mount up with wings. And he pulled it out and let it go. Well, it just hit the back wall and crashed. I don't think that's the point, Isaiah. <laughs> Object lessons that don't work are typically sermon enders. Let me give you a good one that did work. Once again, this was uh, really a preacher who in, in his homiletics was way ahead of his time in some ways, the late Reverend Dr. John R. Claypoo. He was pastor in a rather august, highly liturgical Baptist church in a major city in Texas, and he preached in a gown and a surplice. But one Sunday, at the beginning of his sermon, he reached in his pocket and got out a key ring. Now, you'd have to know the church and the place. That was an astonishment. He just held it up. And he said, you know, our keys are somehow symbols of our life. And he went through it. He said, here's the, the key to my house. It's more than a key. When I look at that, it reminds me of everything domestic in my life. Here's the key to my office. Up here at the church, when I see it, it makes me think of study. It makes me think of admitting. Here's the key to my car. When I see it, it means more. It means mobility, the ability to go. Here's the key to my safety deposit box. It's a reminder. Here we keep precious things. He went through these keys. Locker at the club. Well, everybody's wondering, well, has he lost a key? I'm in the congregation. Where? What's going on? He said, many of you wear crosses as decorative uh, jewelry, necklace, bracelets, something. He picked up a little cross and had been hole punched in it. John said, I've decided to put a cross on my key ring in my pocket so that every time I get my keys out, it's a reminder of the implication of that cross for my home, my office, where I keep precious things, my car and where I go. And right there while they watched. He put it on his key ring, and then he preached a very good sermon on the implications of the cross. Now, it was an inclusio. It was a bookend at the end. John said, today we're going to have an unusual offering, a reverse offering. I filled the offering plates with little crosses, just like the one I put on my key ring. Maybe you'd like to put a cross on your key ring. The... It had an electrifying impact. There were people, it was a rather staid church. It wasn't an emoting church. There were people weeping, got them, put them. Some people carried them for decades. Called the sermon, A Cross in My Pocket. It was done, it was simple. It was done with finesse. It related to the text. And the impact of it was amazing. So, when you deal with object lesson <laughs> lived experiences. They either work or they don't. You may want to test them on somebody and not hide balsa wood airplanes in the pulpit <laughs> before you do it. Now, let me talk a bit about the, 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 the placement of illustrations. And we're talking about lived experience illustrations. Where, where do they potentially go? Now, if you're dealing with a, with a a Haddon Robbins and style big idea sermon. The introduction is going to have the elements of it then, now, and always. The introduction. In my own homiletic approach to it, always there's going to be something in the nowness and the first words out of my mouth, pulling them toward the thenness of the text and then toward the statement of the big idea, the sermon in a sentence. And I do this invariably, really, so that one place for a lived experience is here in the now element of the uh, introduction. 
leading you into thenness and then into the statement of the big idea. Let me illustrate the illustration. Say in a sermon on Psalm 46, first words out of my mouth, be the ocean drilling and exploration company thought they had built an offshore platform that could withstand anything nature threw against it. It was in the North Sea, uh, off of Scotland. 30 stories tall, it was engineered to withstand a 100-foot tall maverick wave or a 100-mile-an-hour wind. And yet, something was thrown at it unknown to this day that caused it to disappear into the North Sea with more than 70 men on it. When it got shook up, it shook down. On the other hand, Frank Lloyd Wright designed the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. <laughs> he, he was a revolutionary design. It had five columns through it that could flex <laughs> when an earthquake hit that seismic prone city. And you can see pictures, everything flattened around it except <laughs> the Imperial Hotel had what it took not to get shook up when everything shook down. Now that's a now element, but I'm moving with that to attach it to the background of Psalm 46, which I believe was the invasion of Sennacherib, bloodthirsty Assyrian, uh, over the tiny walls of Jerusalem. It looked as if <laughs> the city were gonna be destroyed. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. Even though the seas roar, the mountains tumble, the earth cracks, God is our refuge and we will not fear. So I give a little bit of the background. And then the big idea, the sermon in a sentence that Haddon Robbins would say, God can give you what it takes not to get shook up when everything shakes down. And then the body of the sermon. So that story about a building or a structure that shook up and one that shook down is attached to the textual background and leads to the clear statement of the big idea in this very deductive sermon. Now let's stay with deduction a moment. In a deductive sermon, you're going to have moves. And this is very basic blocking and tackling. You know this. In that move, you're going to explain the text, the words, phrases, and clauses that support that rhetorical movement. In each of these instances, regardless of how many divisions or movements your sermon has, I want to have a lived experience. If you have a sermon that has three movements, and the sermons don't have to have three, but you have one that has three, then you have one here at the front door of the sermon. You're going to have a lived experience of some kind in each of the three movements, and likely, you're going to have something that would qualify for one in the conclusion. Excuse me, that means that the possibility of how many stories in a sermon, well chosen. Well, five, if the sermon has three moves. Is that right? There's a minute. Uh, it means five. Now, that means that, say, in a 30-minute sermon, sometimes people ask, why do sermons tend to last about 30 minutes? It has to do with, it has to do with doing these things in 30 minutes. And if you preach a three-movement sermon that has in it an introduction and a conclusion, and you do explanation, lived experience, and application in each of the movements, you, you if you allot three minutes to all of those things, you've got about 27 minutes of speaking. Now, let, let me just say a word about that. This isn't necessarily about illustrations, but it is about three-point sermons. That's the reason I think so many sermons are three movements or three points. It has to do with time. It's difficult to develop a sermon on this schematic in about 30 minutes uh, unless you do three things. But don't be trapped in three-thing sermons. I know some preachers, if they saw a wreck on the freeway, they'd get out of their car and say, I see three things <laughs> in this wreck. It was big, it was bad, and it was expensive. Thank you. Now, 
You don't have to be. Let the shape of the text shape the sermon. Some texts don't talk about three things. But not to overstress the point, you're dealing in a typical sermon with up to five opportunities for lived experience. Something getting into the sermon, a lived experience that underscores the exposition in each movement, illuminates it, and likely one in the conclusion. Now, when I think through my own typical sermon uh, uh, manuscript or brief, I think through this lattice work. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for about five lived experiences, you know, uh, incrementally spaced in the sermon like this. Now, if you go inside of each movement, the lived experience doesn't necessarily have to be the second or third thing. If you're delivering a movement in a sermon where it's a particularly abstract concept, you're looking at a movement that is dealing, say, with something in the epistle, something epistolary, a Pauline abstraction. You may be well served to begin that movement with the lived experience, the lower, lesser, lighter, to shed light on what you're going to explain in the exposition. So this isn't, uh, I, liked, I like, as I said yesterday, I like to use the idea of a mixing bowl almost rather than something linear. You're mixing into this these three classical elements of exposition, lived experience, and application. But they are mixed in and they negotiate into one another in an appropriate way. I always like to give this apology. It's not that a bunch of homileticians got together and said, hey, why don't we tell beginning preaching students to put these three things in? No, no, this came from observing what consensus great preachers do. When you study great preaching, you find these elements in the sermons. It's not, this wasn't an invention. It was a discovery. It was an observation. Here's the kind of things that great preachers tend to do. They explain the text. They illuminate it with a story. And they, uh, and they apply it. So this is the distribution, if you would, of lived experiences in a typical deductive sermon. Now, if you're a narrative preacher, and that is you're preaching a narrative style Sunday sermon that's not so linear, you've got multiple places that you might put a lived experience. If you're narrating a text, you may put a lived experience at the beginning and then tell the story that in a sense solves, speaks into that lived experience. Now obviously you can turn that around, narrate the text, lived experience, at the end that solves it on the now side. Or you may have alternative narration, which I prefer. Sermon I tried to preach this morning in the chapel was an alternative narrated sermon. And that is it moves from now to then to now to then. Well, the nowness are typically illustrations dropped into the narrative alternatively with the exposition of scripture in a narrative style sermon. So you're moving now then, now then, so forth through the sermon and in serial, serial narration and lived experience. This is the way it works in narrative kind of sermons. Different forms of sermons, different ways. I could go on and talk about it, but we just, we don't have time to get into form in terms of where you might put stories. But here's two examples. Uh, well, let me add one more. Typically, in a Cratic sermon, which is particular, 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 and at the end, the big idea, in, a, in an inductive sermon where you're dealing with particulars, every one of these particulars is going to have a, a story with it in the way Cratic typically does a sermon, where you don't solve the sermon until the very end in which the big idea, as he says it, nobody knows whether... The preacher said it, or the congregation thought it. They get to the same place at the same time. Typically, in an inductive sermon, you're going to have a story related to each one of these inductions. That's, that's vintage Fred Craddock. And he, and he was, of all things, a great storyteller in each of these inductions. So here's different models of where stories may go. Now, to back off to this a little bit, what about storytelling itself? And that is the art 
of storytelling. Now, some people think it's a special spiritual gift. I don't think so. I think it's a craft that you learn by practicing. I want to give you a name. You may be familiar with it. You may not. I think one of the great storytellers of my lifetime was on public radio. His name was Garrison Keillor. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Rings a bell with some of you.